Oh, hello and welcome. Uh, uh, this is hands-on intro to Kubernetes and OpenShift for JS developers at Node.js Interactive. Um, thank you all for joining us this morning. I'm doing an overview for the, for the cameras here because um, it looks like they're recording. Uh, so looks like hopefully we're all in the right uh, room and space. Um, you can find these slides at this URL, bit.ly slash k8s-interact. Um, so if you open up that link, uh, you should see the same thing I have on my screen. Um, and uh, good morning. Everyone, I'm Ryan J. Ryan Jarvanen. Uh, you can find me as Ryan J. Most places online. I'll put this uh, URL in our spreadsheet as well. Uh, here is the spreadsheet we're going to want to take a look at for signing in. Okay, I put another copy of the bit.ly URL in the slides. Um, but uh, if you are plan on following along, get your laptop out and join us at this bit.ly address. Um, my slides are at the other bit.ly address, k8s-interact. Um, and this is where we'll be picking usernames. I have uh, claimed user one as my user ID. You are all welcome to grab your own user ID out of this list. Um, you can mark your name uh, if you like, so folks don't, uh, don't claim your particular user ID. But for the rest of the workshop, um, as far as the computers are concerned, you will be known as user and then some number, right? Uh, so copy in this value whenever you see that username. And I think it says this in the spreadsheet, but when you log in, when you're prompted to log in to OpenShift, the password that you're going to use is OpenShift. Yeah, step uh, line three here. Password is OpenShift. Cool. So everyone ready? I will jump ahead. So uh, Ryan and Jan Kleiner here. Um, we are both developer advocates in Red Hat's OpenShift team. Um, we have been, uh, OpenShift uh, is kind of Red Hat's distribution around Kubernetes. Um, you have probably heard of Red Hat before as far as uh, Red Hat Linux or many of the other uh, Linux distros we maintain, CentOS Linux, Fedora Linux, uh, Core OS Linux is, is one of them. Um, all of these distributions are attempts to help you all be productive with open source and particularly with Linux, right? And when we give you a distro, we don't just give you the Linux kernel and say, good luck, you're on your own. We give you a lot more support than that to help ensure your productivity. There's things like uh, security, user access controls, a um, uh, way to source packages from the community, a uh, way to do system updates. And we try to do all of that in our Kubernetes distribution as well. And uh, that's what OpenShift is. So we're going to show you first hour is basically all intro to Kubernetes. So you understand kind of uh, what's happening in the larger community. And then second hour, we'll flip into a little bit of uh, what OpenShift adds to the experience to kind of uh, really help you uh, get some traction and get uh, 
find some productivity, hopefully. So uh, first, I have a quick uh, survey for the folks in the room here to get a little bit more information about who you are and your background. Uh, so how many folks here have experience using containers? Docker or some other, and that's cool. Almost everybody here looks like they're using containers or have used containers. How many folks here have experience using Kubernetes? Looks like half or, or more about, cool. That's uh, encouraging. I've, I've noticed a lot more hands going up at JavaScript events than, uh, than I've seen in, in years past, so uh, that's really cool. Um, how many of those folks, I'm kind of expecting decreasing numbers of hands with each of these, how many ex uh, consider yourselves to be basically proficient with either the OC or kubectl command line tools? Anyone care to raise a hand on that? Cool, cool, some brave folks, it looks like four or five folks. Um, and how many folks feel like they can name five uh, Kubernetes uh, resource types or primitives. So I'm not going to call you on it, but yeah, two, two or three people, okay, not, not a whole lot of folks, but a couple folks feel like they can name a couple of these things. That's really cool. Um, and uh, all right, so out of you folks that are remaining, how many of folks feel like you can confidently say you have a plan for iterative web development that involves Kubernetes, or are you still doing like, Hey, awesome, cool, nice, good to see. All right, well, I would be very curious to chat with you afterwards to see what's working well for you and, and what's not working. Usually I hear folks sometimes uh, what they really need in their local development is to be able to make a small change and to reload their browser and see that change instantly. And uh, using Docker or using Kubernetes, they don't always have a clear path for achieving that kind of real-time development speed uh, on a container-based platform. So hopefully we have time to show you a little bit of that uh, as well at the end. So um, first off, we've got an introduction. We're already going through that part here. Uh, environment setup, and then like I said, Kubernetes basics, and then we'll flip to hands-on with OpenShift. Um, so let's go for it. So I'm going to be floating around the room while Ryan does this first part. So if, as we start doing the interactive stuff, if you have questions, throw up a hand. Definitely, yeah. We have a, a small enough room here. Feel free to raise a hand at any point if you need clarification on anything. Um, that having been set, or if you get stuck on any piece, definitely feel, feel free to raise a hand. Um, but I am going to try to keep the pace moving along during this first hour because it's a Kubernetes is a really deep concept to try to absorb. And so um, it's a lot of info. I'm going to have to work expeditiously to get us through the first hour on time. So um, at a high level, if you're not already familiar, it seems like half of you folks knew this already, but for the other half, Kubernetes is designed to be an ops tool. It primarily, for you folks, being JavaScript developers, are going to recognize it as kind of a collection of APIs for managing container-based workloads. It was uh, started, patterned after some kind of best practices that Google had developed internally for wrangling all of their uh, services. Um, so uh, everything at Google's been uh, containerized for quite a while, over 10 years. And uh, Google Search, Gmail, apps, uh, everything you touch in your web browser. And just based on the number of browser tabs I have open right now, I'm probably touching uh, 20 different containers run by Google right now, uh, just as uh, me, a single user, right? So. Um, Kubernetes, and if you click on this uh, link here, there's a link to uh, what Kubernetes is and what Kubernetes is not. And this is really clearly called out in the upstream Kubernetes documentation. They're trying to narrow the scope of Kubernetes so that it doesn't grow and expand into some huge overblown project uh, that um, is kind of beyond its intended scope and is unwieldy. Um, 
Some folks have kind of migrated from the OpenStack community where they faced certain organizational challenges and some of the Kubernetes organization is kind of an attempt to overcome the uh, difficulties uh, that past open uh, efforts have had. Um, and so this focus and scope uh, um, is really intentional, but Kubernetes is designed not to be an all-inclusive platform as a service uh, like you may have seen from Heroku where you can give it a, a, a repo address and, and tell it what language you're working in and get a, a host name as the uh, response, right? This is really lower level APIs and tools. Um, there's a, some dashboard available, um, but generally it's a, uh, pl it's a platform uh, for running containers more than, uh, more than it is a development platform. Um, on the other hand, OpenShift, uh, which is a CNCF certified distribution of Kubernetes, uh, does try to include platform as a service style workflows, uh, multi-tenant security, um, a container registry, uh, metrics, logs, uh, other things you'd kind of need to have if you were going to run Kubernetes on a, a bare metal environment. We try to give you uh, everything you'd need for uh, you know, to run, run the whole cluster on your own hardware without having to sign up for additional cloud services. Uh, if you're in the case where you you can't. Um, for more information specifically on Kubernetes, definitely check out the upstream documentation. Um, it's available on GitHub, <laughs> and there's a really nice docs site. Uh, OpenShift has its own uh, upstream uh, source publicly available and some pretty decent uh, documentation as well. So feel free to take a look at those later. Um, for today's workshop, all you need is a browser uh, laptop and you should be ready to go. Hopefully you've already picked your username in the sheet. Um, so remember that for, for uh, use in this link right here. So if you haven't already clicked through to the workshop, uh, go ahead and open that up in a second browser tab. I'm going to put that one, uh, do that one side by side. Okay, so I chose user one and password of OpenShift. Log in, and you should see something like this will be spawning up a user environment for you. Uh, this is a kind of a homegrown project that some team members were working on that uh, boots up a shell with some uh, some usage info in here. Okay, so that gives me a couple terminals. I'm going to switch the the order of these. Okay. All right. How are folks doing? How many folks have a browser and a user account? That's Everyone on this side, how many folks are stuck? Anyone need help? No? All right, cool. All right, so everyone sees generally what I'm seeing here. You've got two terminals at your uh, disposal. You can also choose to use one of your own terminals uh, from your laptop, but you would need a couple command line tools, um, OC and kubectl. You can get those later and try to repeat all of these slides examples um, using Minikube. Or uh, we also have a downloadable OpenShift called Code Ready Containers. Um, so either of those can give you a, a, an environment where you can run uh, all of this later from your own laptop. 
Uh, so let's get started. I'm going to paste in a couple variables to initialize my shell and just to make sure that everyone here is familiar with how to copy and paste with this uh, virtual terminal. Um, so let's, let's see if we all know how to use the, our, our uh, keyboards. Uh, I'll do a quick check. I'm going to hit, since I'm on Linux, I'm going to use control C over here. And then to paste into a terminal, anyone know how I paste into a terminal on, on Linux? Control shift V. See if it works on your system. Or if Apple V works for you, great. But if, if not, control shift V hopefully will get you to paste uh, into the terminal. I'm going to paste these uh, shell variables into both. Um, both of these terminals, so have everything ready. And then I'm going to verify that I should already be logged in in one of these terminals since we logged in via the um, web prompt. I'm going to run OC who am I in order to verify my user ID. If I could bump this font a little bit for you. Um, and don't run this next one, but there's an, an example. If, if you were not logged in for some reason, you can run OC login in order to generate some uh, login credentials. This is a pretty basic feature. It's something that's not included in Kubernetes by default. Um, generally, uh, your administrator will have a kubeconfig file that is kind of the um, root credentials. And hopefully they don't give out that file. Hopefully they lock the system down. Um, but worst case, uh, they're giving out admin credentials to everyone in the cluster. So um, this has a nice, uh, OpenShift includes a nice login command that'll help you initialize your access to the cluster with uh, an appropriate level of resource uh, controls and, and uh, permissions. Um, so hopefully you see the right username echoed back here. Um, let's also run kubectl version and test that we have a connection to the cluster. So um, here my response has, we actually, I'm seeing two responses from the, from the command. I'm seeing a, uh, one is the client version and one is the server version. Um, this kind of dual response is something we're going to see pretty commonly from Kubernetes. So keep an eye out for um, sending a request and getting two responses back as your answer. We'll see that kind of pattern coming up, coming up soon. Um, OK, if you have all of those responses, hopefully any errors, anyone need help? Jan's got you covered on the on the late arrivals. Uh, hopefully you can catch up. No problem. No, good luck catching up. <laughs> uh, cool. Uh, I'll, I'll stall a little bit and give you all some background while we have one extra person logging in. So um, one thing that you'll not be touching today, there is a a, a database within every Kubernetes cluster called etcd. It provides a, it was developed at CoreOS. It's been donated to the uh, CNCF, uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Um, it's a distributed key value store with automatic uh, leader election. So if you'd like to see kind of what that looks like, um, I've got a small Small demo here, we could say if this green node is our uh, currently the leader in the cluster, um, I can hit restart on that particular instance. Let's see, or I could stop it, do something like that, and uh, client, oh, I got rate limited. Node 2 is already started. Anyway, this ought to give me a way, maybe the demo's uh, yeah, still rate limited. Ah, here, looks like, okay, node two's down. Um, the cluster elected a new leader and is now doing replication a, a, across and um, is able to do a, a consistent data store across these five nodes. So this type of um, high availability for the uh, all the statefulness of the whole platform is stored within this etcd database. 
Um, if you want to know a lot more about etcd, take a look at these uh, links here. But um, that's kind of sitting behind the scenes. In front of etcd, we have the Kubernetes API that's going to kind of uh, check all of our access control, make sure that the writes into that data store, uh, that the correct people have write control. Um, if we allowed anyone to read from etcd or anyone to write from it, then anyone can modify the state of our cluster. They've essentially got root access to our cluster if they have uh, access to that data store. So the Kubernetes API is going to be um, kind of an enforcement layer that protects that etcd database. Um, every time we have an interaction with the Kubernetes API, uh, I want you to keep an eye out for these five attributes. They're going to be available on almost every piece of data that we fetch from the API. Um, the two ones I want to point out most, uh, that these are the ones I want to emphasize the most critically, is spec and status. I think if you don't remember anything else, remember that Kubernetes provides an API uh, that's asynchronous. And the two attributes you're going to be focused most closely on are going to be setting the spec and then reading from the status. And so when I said Kubernetes always gives you two responses, it'll tell you, well, here's what you asked for. You know, you told me you wanted five containers. You put, you, you said five containers in your spec, um, but currently I'm out of memory and I was only able to spin up two containers, right? And it'll give you the honest, you know, I wasn't able to do it, you know, we only got halfway there. It'll give you a, a realistic answer about the state of the platform, both in terms of what you requested and what's the actual state. And so that's going to be the spec and status fields. Uh, for a full reference, check out this big link at the bottom to the Kubernetes 1.17 APIs. Um, for today, we're going to focus a little more ex uh, tightly down on these five uh, basic API resources. Um, so the first one that we're going to look into is called a node. So everyone here at the uh, node plus JS interactive event knows exactly what I mean when I am talking about nodes, right? Um, this is kind of uh, one of the difficulties I find with uh, talking to folks, especially JavaScript folks, about Kubernetes is there's a lot of terminology overlap, and this is a prime example right here. Um, in Kubernetes terminology, a node is a host machine, um, physical or virtual, uh, where your containerized processes are uh, run. So um, just keep in mind when you're talking to Kubernetes folks, they, they may be talking about nodes in a slightly different way. Uh, node activity is managed via one or more master instances. Um, and I'm going to try running this command right here uh, and see what I get. Uh, let's all try this out and see. Oh, forbidden. That's exactly what we should see. I'm going to run an OC login really quickly and log in as an administrator here. and run the same command, and now I can see the list of nodes. And it looks like for this particular command, this particular cluster, we've got 19 nodes in the cluster. Um, so since I'm logged in as an administrator, I can, I can run the query, I can list nodes on the API using this command line tool, kubectl get nodes. Uh, and apparently, average users do not have access to retrieve that data from the API. Uh, so hopefully you've learned there's a data store, not everyone gets access to it, and uh, kubectl get nodes is a way to uh, list resources by type. Let's see. Oh, so here's my observations. Yeah, basically, Everyone agree to this list of observations from, from this initial section? I know we've only run one command, uh, but any questions about uh, this first part? 
No? Perfect. That is what I hoped. All right, so uh, your JS runs on nodes. Kubernetes is going to actively manage processes. Uh, we'll see that in the next section. And um, we're trying to run on a large cluster scale system where if individual nodes fail or individual processes across this, we can always, uh, we always have sufficient capacity to route around these problems and have a highly available solution exposed to our users. Um, so next section, pods. Um, here is a, this is a quote from uh, one of my uh, team members, uh, Steve Pusty, uh, he used to say, pods scale together and they fail together. Uh, this is one thing I like kind of thinking through in my mind when I'm trying to architect uh, my solutions in Kubernetes. So I like to think of Kubernetes in a way as kind of a, a, like a modeling language for my solutions. And one of the most fundamental units, other than a node, which uh, I kind of gave you a brief look at, uh, pod, a pod is the first resource we're really going to look deeply into. So a pod is a group, in Kubernetes terms, it's a group of one or more co-located containers. Um, the folks at Google, when they were scheduling containers across their cluster, often found that uh, sometimes they would need to schedule not just one, but they'd need a, a sidecar uh, of some sort attached to a container. And if the sidecar ever failed, they'd want to make sure to reboot both processes as a, as a group, right? So this is kind of a multi-process, uh, but all co-located. So um, one example I try to uh, get folks to volunteer, well, hey, where would you want to have two things run together? And I, I usually trick, try to trick someone into offering um, uh, WordPress as an example of, Here's where you would have a, a front end and a database and, uh, you know, WordPress. It's got, uh, it's got PHP and it's got MySQL and, and you want to run them together, right? Um, that's actually not a good example for tying two containers together in a pod. And the reason why is uh, just this quote right here. Pods will scale together and they'll fail together. So if I wanted to scale up my front, my front end, my, my PHP instances, uh, I don't want to add a database with every web instance that I add, right? I want to be able to scale those two tiers independently. And since they need to be scaled independently, they cannot be grouped together in a pod. Um, so uh, for our purposes, we're basically going to have one container per pod. So you can almost think of a pod as a container, but I just need to point out you can have multiple processes, and the way to do that is multiple containers per pod. Cool? Uh, so let's try to run a basic query. This one, I swear, you will be able to execute this query successfully. Uh, unfortunately, it'll return an empty result because you have not provisioned any pods yet. Uh, so let's take a look at what a basic pod spec would look like. So I have up here on the screen, um, hopefully you can see uh, the result of this curl statement. And inside I have the five attributes that I told you would, would be there. There's a kind of data. All this data is internally um, typed and versioned. There's an API version. There's a metadata section. This section, um, particularly, we could see it's, it hasn't been created yet, so the timestamp is null. It has a, uh, an ID or a name um, that will need to be unique within this uh, namespace. And then um, there's some labels that uh, we'll learn more about labels uh, in the next section. And then, like I said, there's a spec. Um, and currently, we don't have a status. That's because we haven't created this yet. And Kubernetes will start filling in the status as it makes progress towards achieving the spec that we've requested. Does that make sense? So I'm going to do a uh, command to basically provision this container of Jan's, thank you Jan, we're going to provision 
Node.js int workshop uh, from Docker Hub. Uh, so feel free to follow along and copy and paste this kubectl or, or kubectl, uh, depending on uh, how you like to pronounce it. kubectl create dash f and paste that file in. And that should essentially tell the API that you want to load that JSON um, and you would like to provision a new pod. Uh, any questions about that piece? Kubernetes is an API. You can manipulate these API endpoints to do work on the cluster. So congratulations, you have, if you hadn't before, you have now provisioned your first pod. Um, so if you wanted to access the API using curl, um, not super advisable, but here's just an example. Feel free to copy and paste if you're interested to show how you would do that same listing data by type um, just using a raw request. And if you look into the path here, you could see API v1. v1 was in our um, uh, uh, spec. Let's see if I can find it in here. API version v1. Um, and so that's also encoded here in the API. And this API is actually going to be almost identical to the path that we were, if we were able to access etcd, the etcd storage path looks almost identical to this. Um, the Kubernetes API is really just doing kind of enforcement and access control on top of the etcd API. Um, so Let's go a little bit deeper. Instead of fetching all pods or all resources by type, let's try to fetch an individual resource by type and ID. Um, you could either do type space ID or type slash ID. Uh, either format works fine. Uh, and we can output the result as JSON. Here's how I could do that with curl. And the same thing with the command line. So I did uh, get pod to fetch the uh, resource of type pod with the following name, hello k8s. Uh, we can all do this at the same time, and we can all have the projects named the same thing because we're all in different namespaces. Uh, so this hopefully is working for everyone. Um, any questions about this section? Makes sense so far? One thing I would like to point out is the difference between our initial, uh, let's see, we initially had this curl statement. And if I count the number of lines in here, we initially had 25 lines. And if I do get pods, hello JSON and count the number of lines in here after it hits the API. Wow, Kubernetes filled in 130 some odd lines of, uh, of additional information. Um, so we could take a look at you know what changed. Well, um, now we have a status field. This didn't exist before, and Kubernetes has started filling in all of this information about, um, you know, is the, is the container up and running? Uh, how's it doing? It's making a lot of reports into that status field. Um, it still has a spec field as well. The spec field has also grown quite a bit. We've added in some uh, resource limits some default resource limits here. Um, there's now a creation timestamp that's been populated. Um, quite a bit more data in there. So Kubernetes will do a lot of work for you automatically, but it's also really nice to have a clear starting point that you can hand off to other users in your team. Um, as the folks attending this section, um, I would expect you will need to do a lot of work to serve up these JSON or YAML files to your team members so they don't need to learn what is a pod, what is a deployment. Um, a lot of this 
Um, you almost want to hide this as much as possible. And OpenShift gives you some nice ways of providing a you know, real smooth paths platform as a service Heroku style uh, experience on top. So we'll, we'll see that uh, coming up soon. Um, let's see. Let's take a look at the exact same data, but I'm going to add instead of dash O JSON, I'm going to add dash O YAML. And if you had a team that was really keen on using YAML instead of JSON for whatever reason, uh, maybe you like uh, comments or uh, you dislike curly braces, either one. Um, Uh-oh, lost my signal. So did I lean into the leaned into the presenter too hard. All right, cool. We're back. Um, all right, so let's see. Uh, one other thing you can try is uh, the kubectl describe command. This is meant to be kind of a more human readable output, um, assuming humans like uh, tab separated uh, responses. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is uh, Kubectl describe is another kind of verb you could use in addition to the uh, get and, uh, you know, getting by type, getting by type and ID. You can also describe instead of get uh, in order to get a, a slightly different formatted output that, that's uh, probably a little bit more human readable. Um, observations from this section, um, API resources uh, provide a declarative specification and asynchronous fulfillment. Um, we learned about spec and status. Um, if any of these processes, uh, since there's only one process per container, it's very easy for Kubernetes to judge whether that single process has failed or not, and then restart the container as a, as a result. Uh, pods are scheduled to be run on nodes. Um, we can actually see that uh, if we look in the JSON, I think there is a, uh, where does it get set? There's some kind of label in here, node name right here. We can see the node that it got scheduled onto um, in our spec. Uh, the API ambidextrously supports both JSON and YAML. Any questions from this section? Welcome to Pod Town. You, you now know what pods are. All right, services. Services, uh, abbreviated SVC, give you a single endpoint uh, for a collection of replicated pods. Um, so I think this is a confusing term coming from like the web world. I think of a service as a, as a web service, like that's my Apache server or something usually. But this is more service from like a network endpoint perspective. Um, it's a single identifier for a group of, of, uh, of web services. And um, we can generate one using the kubectl expose command. Uh, so I'm going to run that off real quickly um, and then take a look at the result. So I've generated a new, uh, we can see there's an API version, a kind of data, metadata field, we have a spec, um, and a status. Uh, all the things that I said we would, uh, we would find. Um, the spec selector out, uh, field happens to have something that says run hello k8s. This will come in a little bit later. Um, but this is actually going to be running a query selector against the API searching for these two labels, uh, a key of run and a value of hello k8s. Um, and this load balancer will forward traffic to anything that matches that query, any pods that match that query. Uh, so we'll see a little bit more about that in a second. But first, uh, I want to show you uh, another nice feature of these services. Anytime you create a service in Kubernetes, uh, kubedns will automatically start uh, providing a name server resolution for this value. So we can now do curl 
um, to hello k8s uh, within our individual namespace, and hopefully you'll see a response from the container that you provisioned. Um, everyone able to see that? Raise your hand if you don't. All right, aha, we caught him. Everyone saw it, hopefully. <laughs> All right, cool, congratulations. Hopefully that worked for you. Um, another nice uh, tip, if you wanted to slice specific values out of the JSON response, uh, you can use this uh, get with a uh, resource type and ID, and then instead of dash o JSON, use dash o JSON path to select out a particular field. Um, this particular field is the node port value. If I wanted to try to access this container from outside the cluster, I could try hitting uh, an address like this. Unfortunately, this is still an internal IP for Amazon. Um, but if I had an external IP, um, I ought to be able to curl the uh, this high numbered port on any node in the system, and it'll get forwarded to the right uh, service internally. Um, it still doesn't give you full like a domain name servicing. You'd still probably need load balancers in front of that, but um, that's your shortest route to getting traffic into a cluster from the outside is this node port service uh, that, that gives you an easy way to access these services on a high numbered port from outside the cluster. Um, communication inside the cluster is super easy uh, as we have just proven. Um, we could see I have currently have one pod running serving those requests um, and you could see in this, in this command, I'm running get pods L. This is a new type of query. We're, we're, we're querying for resources by type doing get pods, but we don't want all pods. We want only the pods that match this particular label selector. That's what dash L is, label selector. So we want to find all resources by type assuming they match this key and value in their labels section. Um, our service and our pods happen to have that match, and that's how it does the mapping from the service to those pods. So if we delete all of the pods that, uh, that the service is routing traffic to, um, that should cause this to fail, even though the service still exists the service is no longer able to pass the traffic onto the pod. Um, and so the only thing I'm trying to prove here is that the services and the pods can uh, exist independently. You can have a service that uh, doesn't have any pods associated with it at all. You can also have services. There's a, a type of service called a headless service. I don't know if I agree with the name, but headless service. You can have something that is a service shows up within the cluster with a local DNS, kube DNS uh, resolution, um, but the service is actually pointing back outside the cluster to a legacy data store, right? A you know, big Oracle database or something. Um, so your microservices within the cluster still have uh, discoverability um, as long as you're creating this service abstract for it to uh, have something to resolve against. Um, but the service that you create can point to pods matching a label selector, or it can point to uh, back outside the cluster to something else. Um, so anyway, service, that's a kind of a load balancer or a network endpoint for a collection of processes. Uh, so with this, hopefully we have deleted our pods and deleted our services and gotten back to a clean state. Any questions from this section? No? Nothing? Man, you're a quiet group. I should have brought coffee for you all. All right, service basically means load balancer. Hopefully that's, that's clear. Um, label selectors can be used to organize workloads. Um, once we have a pod provisioned, um, we can relabel it or change the labels in order to uh, remove it from behind a load balancer or to put it, to, to surface it behind a load balancer. 
Um, the service re yeah uses label selectors. Uh, that's it. Yeah, and and they can be deleted and created independently. Um, there's no linkage uh, lifecycle wise between the two. Deployments. Any questions before we move on to deployments? Jan, do you want to attempt jumping into this section? All right, all right. Uh, OK, well, I'm going to try to power through, and we'll swap at the open shift then. OK, so we still have a lot to cover. No one's asking any questions yet, so I'm going to try to pick up the speed and get a little bit, you know, we'll see if I lose any of you in this next section. All right, a deployment. Now that you have all created pods, never, ever do that again. This is like math class where it's like, oh, now, now I've introduced Algebra 2, and now you don't have to do long division or, you know. Uh, it's all, here's a calculator. Deployments just generally solve a lot of the stuff that we just did with pods. Pods were a, an earlier abstraction and good to learn because they're your fundamental unit of scale. But deployments are how you scale up a collection of pods. So this is a much more useful abstraction. Let's dig into deployments and learn how to really get work done. Um, so this is going to help you specify container runtime requirements in terms of pods now that we know what a pod is. So um, we could have a shorter command here. We could just run the top half of this in order to deploy Jan's image that we uh, previously had deployed in that pod uh, specification. But I'm going to add an extra line. I'm going to add these extra flags, dry run and dash o json. What those two flags allow me to do, um, dry run says, Instead of immediately provisioning this deployment, instead, marshal up all the JSON or the YAML and throw it all to standard out. Does that make sense? Um, the reason why I like showing this extra step is that this gives you a clear way of generating your own deployment spec. And then you can hand that off to other developers. Or you could put it in a Helm chart. Or you can, like, you have a way of reproducing this and modifying it, changing the labels, changing the resource allocation. You know, you have hopefully a starting point that you can continue iterating on and something you can give to junior developers uh, where you don't have to really explain what a deployment is or how to use. Coop cuddle uh, in an advanced way. Hopefully, they could coop cuddle create and then get back to developing. So um, that's why I have the second half here. So let's all create a deployment.json file. So we have something we can share with other users. Um, this is actually showing me um, some deprecation warnings. Uh, good to know that there are changes upcoming in the API that I might want to know about. I tried using this generator run pod v1, and this is actually, uh, if we wanted to make that pod.json that we had earlier, um, adding in that uh, generator flag here um, essentially gives us exactly the pod.json that we started with earlier. Um, so in case you wanted to generate that, it looks like this deprecation warning we were just shown is actually giving us advice on this new feature that, that's newly been added, and now we have a clean way of generating pod specs as well. That's, uh, last time I did this workshop, that was not available. So new, new stuff coming down the, down the pipe as, uh, as we work. Um, let's also take a look at our deployment.json. Um, so does it have the five attributes that I mentioned? It has a kind of data, um, a version of data, um, and this I may need to update this if it's being deprecated soon. Um, it has some label selectors. Remember how we did that uh, uh, selector that was um, set to run equals hello k8s? This label selector is going to say our deployment should match that label. Any, anytime someone does a label-based query with resource type equals deployment, this is going to match on those uh, key value labels. 
there's a spec that says what our current replication level is. Um, and there's a template that is basically an embedded pod spec. You can see inside this template, there's a second spec. Um, this is the pod spec kind of dumped within the uh, deployment spec. And then here's the status for how far along we've made it in this uh, particular deployment progress. So let's launch that deployment. Um, now that you have that deployment file, you should be able to store this on GitHub or hand it off to anyone. Anyone should be able to kubectl create uh, into their own cluster to deploy that particular container. Uh, we're going to run this kubectl expose command in order to make a service, just like we did before. Except this time we're exposing a deployment instead of a pod. And we're adding on this dry run flag in order to create a service.json. This is just to show you that Kubernetes is like a modeling language, and you use these JSON files in order to kind of model the topology of your microservices solution. So if you have lots of microservices, you're probably going to have one service file per microservice and one deployment per replicated uh, web tier, uh, essentially. So you may end up having collections of these in a repo, in which case you could do something like kubectl create dash f and then a directory folder, say so everything from staging dot star, you know, all the, all the YAML files in that folder, let's launch them all. You could give it a path as well as a, uh, a file name. Um, any questions about that piece? No, I'm going to create the service, and we're going to see uh, what we get as a result of this query. I'm running kubectl get po, which is short for pod, comma, svc, short for service, comma, deploy, short for deployment. This is listing multiple resources by type uh, using the command line. Nice to know that you can, uh, you can easily do that as well. And now that we have a pod, a deployment, and a service, I should be able to run curl and verify that we have access to the container. Cool. Next step is uh, let's scale up that container and see if we can demo some of the high availability features of this cluster. Uh, so I can use the kubectl scale command on the uh, resource of uh, type deploy ID equals hello or name is hello K8S, and I want to update the spec with a new replica value and set the replication to three. Uh, let's do, let's list all pods by, uh, list all resources by type, uh, where type equals pod, and it looks like I now have three containers up and running. Uh, hopefully you have three up and running. If not, one, it may still be, you know, working towards that goal. And if it's not there, hopefully it'll give you the truth uh, about how much progress has been made. Here's another nice uh, trick um, that we'll kind of use. Use whatever your default editor is. So we saw a kube, kubectl get. Uh, getting resources all by type, getting by type and ID. Uh, what about kubectl edit? What do you imagine that does? It looks like I've opened this file in an editor. Uh, I'm going to find the replicas line, and I'm going to edit this to five. Feel free to follow along if, if you dare. It looks like VI is the default editor. So I went over to this line and hit S for substitute, and then 5, and now I'm going to hit escape, colon, W, Q, uh, for folks that aren't used to VI. Um, and what do you imagine this will do? Am I going to write this file locally? Where's this going to go? This actually 
will send the file back across the network and save it back to our etcd database in the Kubernetes API. And now if I get pods, I have five pods up and running. So not that I would recommend live editing these uh, resources in the API, but if you're learning, um, this may be a great way to tweak certain values. Or if you're just scaling up a web service, this is a, you probably want to use the scale command instead of uh, kubectl edit, right? Um, but this command's kind of uh, medium smart. Like if I open this up and uh, write it out without any changes, it'll notice um, you're not actually shipping any changes to the API, and it'll give me feedback to that effect. So it's, uh, uh, it does a decent job of allowing you to quickly edit things um, while staying out of your way. And I think if you customize the uh, editor variable, you can use something other than uh, VI as your, as your default. Um, so cool, We've, we have all scaled up. I'm gonna run this get pods uh, dash dash watch in this lower shell down here. And uh, I am not gonna background it. I had this amper stand on the end, but I'm just gonna leave it running in the, in the foreground. Um, so that's gonna continually keep an eye on my number of pods and uh, leave the connection open. This is like a streaming connection. JavaScript folks, uh, as a JavaScript person, I am always really excited when I see fully asynchronous APIs, but then in addition to that, streaming APIs where I can continually get a streaming response as the, as the uh, updates come in. So this is huge that uh, the API supports this type of watch functionality, in my opinion, um, and that there's a nice way of accessing it from the command line as well. Um, so this embedded query here, this is going to do basically a, a fetch from the API to get a, a series of pod names um, that are all uh, random pod names that are space separated so that I can run kubectl delete pod and delete three resources by ID. That's basically what this complica complicated command is doing. Um, so feel free to copy and paste. And what this ought to do is kind of like a shotgun blast of damage across your cluster and take out three random containers out of your group of five. So let's see what happens when we sustain some damage. Um, it looks like right away in our watch down below, the Kubernetes API has recommend or recognized that these containers went missing. It was our fault, of course, here. But this could have easily been um, one node out of our cluster suddenly went offline. And all of these processes are suddenly unaccounted for. The API is going to recognize that a node has gone offline. Um, it's going to flag these containers as being down. Um, and it's going to provision new containers on other available nodes in order to get us back up to our expected allocation, which was uh, five running pods. Uh, so hopefully you're back up to full health uh, at this point. Another thing you could do is get deploy. Oops, spelled it wrong, get deploy. And that ought to show you how many are ready, up to date, available, um, all those nice details. So hopefully you all have five healthy pods. Uh, feel free to rerun that uh, shotgun blast of damage as many times as you like, and hopefully it'll keep regenerating. Um, that's what deployments do, is deployments kind of uh, allow you to have a replication spec, and then whatever happens throughout the life of the cluster, it's going to continue working to achieve your spec, even if you artificially knock it out of alignment. It'll keep, it's like, like your thermostat. You set it to 72 degrees, and even if you leave the refrigerator door open and the window open, it's gonna keep trying to heat the house or cool it, depending on what the temperature is outside. Um, so 
Uh, yeah, it'll keep working to achieve your goal and give you an honest answer in that status field. So observations from this section. Dry run flag will help you generate a new resource specification. Um, a deployment spec contains a pod spec in its template field. Um, the API provides get, edit, uh, get and edit, uh, or edit and watch operations in addition to the get, set, and list. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So in this first one, if I want if I want to create a YAML file, then I include dry run in order to create a file. If I don't care about creating a file at all, we can just do we can just do this command. This will create the deployment immediately. It, it will create the file and then post the file to the API. It'll do two steps in one, right? Create it, post it to the API, don't even write it to disk. If you want an intermediary step where you create it, write it to disk, and don't touch the API, and then you have a file that you can share, um, that's why I, I added the extra flags. But you can skip a step just with run. Um, and then running create, this is also just one step, but based on the file you have. So it gives you an opportunity to edit the file, change the labels, change the default replication, so that when they do the create, the default replica is, is five replicas, right? Um, so I like having that extra step, so when I share things, I, I have something more customized that I share. Uh, so it, it depends on what you need. Uh, I do run, uh, this is how, this is what I do on the command line is this. Um, but if I want to share it, uh, dry run. Yeah. Good question. Thank you. Uh, so last section. And then I will hand it over to Jan for the OpenShift pieces. Uh, replica set. A replica set provides replication and lifecycle management for a specific image release. Does anyone remember what my title was on that last section? Deployment helps you. It's almost the exact same thing. Replication and lifecycle management for a specific image release. Let's see how it's different than deployments, because this sounds very similar uh, on the surface. Uh, so let's take a look at the current state of our deployment. Uh, it looks, hopefully, you are all able to fetch data. Um, you were able to fetch it when you had a single replica, and you scaled up to five. We had some damage, but we recovered, and it, it still looks healthy. Um, I'm watching, I was watching the pods in this lower terminal. I'm going to do a control C and, and break out of that, um, or, or foreground if, if you need to uh, foreground a, a job. Um, and I'm going to run get deploy in this uh, with the with the dash w or dash 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 watch either one, and we'll watch the uh, deployment. We'll make a deployment dashboard in this lower terminal. Um, and then in the upper terminal, I'm going to run kubectl set image. Uh, this command is basically just going to uh, edit the, de it's going to pull down the deployment resource from the API, open up the file, find the spec uh, and the pod within the deployment spec, and then look at the uh, identifier of the image within the container, within the pod, within the deployment. Uh, it's kind of all nested in that JSON. And it's going to update the image value and set a new tag. Now we're adding colon v1 on our container. So this is going to do a, a uh, roll us forward to a new deployment. Um, let's assume our developers have already uh, 
cut a release, something's already made it past QA. This is more release management than, than a developer move, but um, let's go ahead and roll forward. And we should see uh, in our dashboard below that some activity is happening. We can uh, get RS to look at the replica sets, and it looks like there is currently some, some at action going on. I'm going to run this. Uh, oh, we could already see the new value. And if I get replica sets, it looks like I'm fully rolled forward from this to this, whatever that means. Let's see if we could find out some more info. Uh, get pods. If we look at the names of the pods, you can see hello K8S. This is named after the name of the deployment. And then there's this middle identifier. This is an identifier for the replication controller. And then this is a random ID for the individual pod. Uh, so all of these from the old replication controller are terminating. Oops, scrolled up too far. And the new replication controller is running. And we have our new response, good morning, uh, for the classroom. Was everyone able to, to roll forward there? Yeah, no, no problems anywhere? Perfect, excellent. Um, let's try, uh, now let's take a look at our rollout history. And um, it looks like we have one, uh, two, two revisions currently on, uh, that Kubernetes has tracked um, relative to this deployment we've just created. I can do a rollout undo in order to roll back. And let's run some uh, curl requests, and we can watch. Let's watch as this changes. Uh oh, that should be eighty eighty. There we go. Yeah, hopefully that was that was a typo on my part. But you should have, as long as these applications are stateless uh, web apps, and and if you're storing your session information in a distributed cache like uh, memcache or Redis, then you ought to be able to do uh, zero downtime uh, rolling, rolling deployments uh, if you are reasonably stateless in your architecture. Um, so Kubernetes is great for uh, high availability of your web resources, uh, zero downtime rollouts and rollbacks, um, which sometimes is a whole lot of stuff that developers uh, aren't always concerned with. Um, so I'm going to do a cleanup. Let's do kubectl delete service, comma, deployment. We're going to delete two resources by type uh, as long as they have the same ID. This is kind of like, uh, does that make sense? Whoops. Which is back to terminal three. Uh -oh, we've got picture in picture enabled somehow. All right, figured it out, cool. All right. <laughs> Sorry for the technical difficulties. Let's see what happens. And then I'll do get all, and looks like there's a couple pods being cleaned up, but otherwise we hopefully have cleaned up after ourselves. Any questions on that section? No? Do you understand the difference between replica sets and deployments? Vaguely, replica sets are if I have that uh, initial image that's uh, colon latest, and I have five replicas, and I want to roll forward to a v1 tag, the replica set, it's going to, the, de the deployment will create a new replica set, and it will start scaling up the pods on this new replica with the v1 image. And since we requested a spec of five, we're going to, the deployment is going to try to keep us at a spec of five, even though it's doing this rolling deployment from replica one to replica two. So as it scales replica uh, v1 up, it'll scale this one down, 
and try to roll us across and keep us at an even five containers as it does the rolling deployment. Um, and so the deployment resource under the hood is actually using a replica resource uh, to manage the pods, right? So the Kubernetes API has higher order resources that leverage lower level resources in order to do automation. Um, and a deployment is a higher order resource that takes advantage of um, replica sets primarily, which then in turn take advantage of pods. So it's all kind of stacked like a, a Russian doll. And uh, best thing I can recommend is use deployments when possible because that already takes advantage of, of all the lower level pieces and then that'll keep things nice and simple for you. But hopefully you understand that this is like a modeling language with building blocks and um, the more you learn about it, the more you learn how to architect your solutions. Uh, and then you have a, a giant pile of uh, YAML and or JSON that hopefully you can share with junior developers to give them a clear starting point and to make things easier for them. So I'm going to do a check-in on folks now that we're through the first half. How many folks have experience using containers? I already asked this one, and it was 100%, right? How many folks can say they have experience using Kubernetes? 100%? Uh, uh, how many feel like you're maybe basically proficient with kubectl? I think hopefully you've done enough command line interactions. You can list resources by type, grab them by ID, edit them if you need to. Uh, how many people feel like they can name five basic Kubernetes primitives? Anyone feel like they can't? I'll single you out, I swear. No, <laughs> to make threats at folks. All right. So hopefully you are all ready to see uh, what OpenShift adds on top of Kubernetes. We saw a lot of low-level uh, ops-focused use cases, which are great to know if you're trying to replicate something as production quality as possible. Nailing these JSON templates uh, allows you to reproduce things really easily. Um, but allowing for that real-time iterative web development is super important. And being able to not overwhelm junior developers with terminology, especially when you're trying to tell them that a node is something different or a service is something they're not used to, um, this is where OpenShift comes in. So Jan? You ready to take it away? Cool. Yeah, you bet. Uh, and you prefer your own laptop, or this is fine? Clips on here. So for the rest, you're trying to turn off the. <laughs> I'm gonna press the picture in picture button. Oh. Okay. I'm gonna try. I'm a leaner too, so we'll have to see how this goes. Um, so for the rest of the workshop, oh man, this is not my trackpad, Ryan. I, want, <laughs> I just want to make it take up the whole screen. Apple F on a Windows keyboard. Awesome. All right. OK. So for the rest of the workshop, we're going to be just focusing in this one window. So you have this panel here on the left-hand side where it says Workshop Overview. That's going to be your instructions from now on. Um, if you scroll, um, go ahead and click that blue Continue button. And I'll explain what we're doing here. So we're still going to be working in this web terminal. Let me control C down here. Um, but this has some just click, click and run. So this OC help, this is just to make sure that, that these commands will actually run for you. Um, so we've been using kubectl or kubectl, whatever you prefer to call it. Um, we're going to be using OC from here on out. OC does everything kubectl can do, um, but additionally has some of the um, features of OpenShift. So it's 
OpenShift uh, command line tool uh, that does everything that kubectl can do, but also some other things that we'll see in a moment. And you can get the, the help for that command uh, right there. So hopefully that worked for you. We're going to be using a project. You've already been working in a project, this user one project that you're in. Projects are somewhat analogous to namespaces in Kubernetes, uh, but a project is an OpenShift construct that also kind of ties ties that role, the role-based access control to your namespace. Um, so you as user whatever number have access to the user whatever project, but you don't have access to my project. You don't have access to all the projects like the admin of the cluster does. So you're, you're working in a single project right now. Um, if you run this OC project command, and you can type these or you can just click the button to execute them, it should tell you what project you're using. Oh, I've done it. Here we go. I have to like do this at arm's length. Um, I do this on treadmills all the time where you like lean forward and then it turns off. Um, so if you click that, you should see your own project um, come back there. So we haven't looked at the OpenShift web console yet. We're going to do that now. So there's a link here you can click. You also can just simply click on the word console up here. And that's going to drop you in. You might have to log in. You're probably already logged in. But so what this is, and we've got tiny resolution here. So there we go. We'll pull it over so you can see the menu. So this is the OpenShift web console. If you don't want to use the command line um, ever or sometimes, you can use the web console to get a lot of the same things done. By default, it's going to drop you into this administrator view. And you can tell that by this toggle up here. So this is kind of like the default view if you need to do more ops-related things in the cluster. Um, there is also a developer view. And I didn't click my project first. Select your project. I'll show you what I'm, what I'm going to do. Click into your project here to make sure you've actually got a project selected. Left click. This is. Again, <laughs> not my trackpad. Um, and then go in here, toggle to developer. And now you're in this developer view. There is nothing to look at right now because we haven't got anything deployed because we cleaned up after ourselves after this last one. Um, but now we're going to look at um, using the web console and using a tool called, or a project called source to image to actually go from source code to um, a container that's running on the platform without having to build the image manually, not having to create a Docker file, not having to like already have an image available. We're going to use some of the features to, of the platform to do that for us. So source to image, as I mentioned. So this is a, it's an open source project. It's included with OpenShift, but you can also use it outside of OpenShift. It's available um, for use. Um, and what it does essentially is you give it um, source code, like a Git URL, GitHub URL. Um, you can either tell it what kind of code it is. You could say this is Node.js, or it can usually infer that based on information in the repository. So like if there's a package.json file, it's going to say, OK, I'm going to use a, a Node.js builder image to create this application image. Um, so that's what we're going to do now. So if you're willing to, and if you have a GitHub account, the best way to do this would be to fork um, this repository of Ryan's, because that way you can set up, actually, what's our timing? Or we see if we even have time to do the webhook stuff. My phone's over there. All right, you can try it. So if you, um, if you want to, go ahead and fork this. Um, I'm not going to use yours. I'm, I'm signed into mine, so we'll, I'll do my own. But uh, if you want to fork Ryan's uh, repo here, then you'll be able to uh, do this with your own copy of the code. Um, but what we're going to do, I'll give you a minute to do that. Um, but I'll go ahead and start walking you thro through what we're going to do next. And I'll pause to, to let everybody catch up. But so over here, this topology view is going to look cool in a minute once we have something deployed. In the meantime, when there's no workloads running, it gives you this screen resolution is really odd. Uh, there we go. That's a little better like that. So it's going to give you um, some options here of different ways that you can deploy things. We're going to use from Git. But just to walk you through what else there is, you can deploy an image, which is what we were doing on the command line before. Um, you can deploy from a catalog. 
This is going to give you um, a catalog of things on the cluster that are available that you can use to build off of. So this is, I'll just show you really quickly. So in the developer catalog, you'll see things like uh, languages and runtimes. So if you've got something that's PHP or whatever, this gives you a starting point to build from. There's also databases you can deploy, um, CI, CD solutions, Jenkins, whatever you want, you can deploy all of those from that catalog. Let's go back over here though. Um, you can deploy from a Docker file. So if you've just got a Docker file out there somewhere, you can deploy from that. You can drop in YAML or JSON. So like the deployment .json file that Ryan was creating when you did the dry run before, you could just drop it in and just, and just say, click it, paste it, you're done. Um, or databases, which again maps back to the databases we were looking at in the catalog before, but it's just an easier view into that. So all that to say, click from Git. You're going to put your, um, your fork here. I think I still have mine. Let's, let's find out. I'll use my own. Well, but, yeah, you're like, I have all the power. Ooh, all right, let's do it. You use yours. Um, I'll use Ryan's. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so hopefully we'll get to that in the next step. Um, I think we'll have time. So, so drop your, your Git repo URL there, scroll down, click Node.js. When we're doing it in the web interface here, it allows you to explicitly select which builder image you're using. You can do this from the command line too with the OC new dash app command. And in that case, you can just give it that Git URL and you don't even need to tell it it's Node.js, it'll figure it out. Um, you can select what version of Node you want to use. I'm just going to leave it 10 by default. Um, <clears throat> and then it's, it's giving you these options here to create an application name. So this is really just creating some labels um, on your deployment. And you'll see what that means in a minute. But it's allowing you to have like a, an application grouping. It's just a logical grouping of components in an application um, to make it kind of easy to see and manage. Uh, but it's using standard Kubernetes naming labels um, to do that. And then there's the name for your uh, deployment, which we'll just call it HTTP base. That's fine. By default, hopefully you can see this, in the advanced options, by default when you create something this way in um, the web console, it's going to create a route for you. We didn't really get into routes before. Routes are a OpenShift construct. They're a, like a an additional benefit and feature that OpenShift adds. Um, we talked before about how the services that you create were accessible with kubedns inside the cluster, but not unless you use the, the crazy node port thing, not accessible from outside the cluster. I'm not saying it was crazy, but you know, it's not normal. It's not how you normally would. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It doesn't routing. This So Kubernetes has ingress. Here we're using routes. Um, I love it because it's all you do is check a box and it creates a URL for you. So go ahead and click create. Ryan, could you hand me my table? That way I can keep an eye on the time. 
All right, so what you see now, this is that topology view we talked about before. This light gray circle around it, that's our application grouping. That application name was HTTP base app. If we had more than one um, app or component in this application grouping, they'd all show up in this little bubble here. We only have one because this is pretty simple. You've got these decorators here. This one, this one that looks like a little circle thing, that's the status of your build. Your build is running right now. We can click on that on this window. Um, yeah, I'm going to just pull my, well, that, that helps. All right, there we go. Um, so our build is running right now, and that's running that, that build to image, I'm sorry, source to image uh, process that we talked about. Um, I'll come back over here so we can see it as it completes. It looked like it was almost done. As that completes, um, you will st you'll see this turn to a green check mark. And then so once the build completes, then the deployment will start. Um, let me go back and check and make sure all is well. It's running npm install. It wasn't actually quite finished. It was doing the first step. Now it's on the second step here. So you can actually see everything that's going on. So if something were to go wrong, you've got the logs here for that build, and you can see um, see what happens. So sometimes if there's like a dependency issue in like the npm uh, install process or something fails, you can go here and see, oh, OK, I need to go fix something in my code and then uh, come back. OK, so now we see push successful here. Come back over to topology view. That's a green check. Now soon we'll start to see this uh, ring around that change as the deployment, there we go, as the deployment uh, starts rolling out. So I clicked on that center circle there to get this little panel to show up. This is information about our deployment. Um, you can see the pod here, the container is creating right now. You can view the logs for your pod from here as well by clicking into that. It's still coming up, so there's no logs just yet. Here we go. Oh, OK, so now it's listening. That shows us the app is up and running. If you click this, this is going to give you that route that was created, that URL. And there is our very fancy uh, web application right there. So hopefully, you all got to that same point if you were following along. Um, but so now it, is, it has deployed that. We can get to it from this URL, and it is running. Um, so you again, you could have done all of that on the command line with OC new app as well. You would have then had to have exposed the service to create a route. You'd have to do that extra step if you did it through the command line. And we talk, ooh, scrolling the wrong way. Um, we talk a little bit about how you would do that here if you wanted to do that from the command line instead. Any questions about that? No, okay, we'll move on. So what Ryan was talking about before, if we want to set up webhooks so that anytime we make a change uh, to the code and actually push it out, it'll do a new build and deployment, that's what we can set up now. So um, if you created a fork, go ahead and um, go back to your terminal. How, how many folks are currently doing some type of like git push to deploy? Is it anyone using that currently? Not too many, okay. That was like a revolutionary five years ago, um, but I'm like curious how many people are, are actually <laughs> using that to kick off deployments today. I think a lot of folks have kind of maybe decoupled uh, how that works, um, but it, it is, Definitely nice to know that uh, you can wire up automation, whether it's just deploying to your QA stage or earlier stages mm -hmm. or, or kicking off various types of automation based on changes in a repo. Um, so if, if there aren't a huge number of people super keen on mm -hmm. this, we could move forward to the rsync stuff. Yeah. You have a question about it? Code ready yeah. containers. Um, that one, since the webhook is going to try to call back into the cluster, the cluster would need to be addressable somehow. So there's a uh, some type of service relay service you can run, and I forget the name of oh, it. Is it Ultra Hook or something? Ultra Hook. That sounds I right. Feel like it, maybe. It's that sounds like it's very well could be the answer. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. what you used to when uh so now with OpenShift 4 we have code ready containers. When we had mini shift um for OpenShift 3, um I'm I'm pretty sure Ultra Hook is what we had in the slides back when we did that. 
Yeah. Um, so yeah, we can. I haven't actually done it with code ready containers, but that should be the process. I think usually for code ready containers, if I have a local station, um, rather than relying on a webhook, I can just click on the build button uh, in the dashboard to trigger a new build uh, whenever I need to. Or uh, what I like doing, instead of doing builds uh, based on whatever whatever's coming in, that might be useful, but I like testing my code before I make the commit. And we can do that using some rsync uh, features that, that we have queued up next, I think. Yeah. So, so that one's even more useful for local uh, development purposes. Is anyone super excited to see the GitHub web hooks and is going to be sad if we skip it? Okay, you can also do it yourself because yeah. this cluster will be up for, well, yeah, probably feel free, at least the rest of the day. Feel free so to try to the web hooks on your them. own or stop by the Red Hat booth afterwards and we can give you a demo of the uh, Git push to deploy and uh, show the automation from, from GitHub back in. Um, it's nice, but uh, if you're not currently using it, um, just make a note that it, it does exist. Uh, and I think this, hopefully, live development is really where I see a, a huge opportunity for front-end developers to get some traction with Kubernetes. Because I think, for, for me, this is where you see a huge amount of value. If you're doing lots of microservices, uh, you can have uh, maybe 20 different uh, containers deployed in a Kubernetes environment, do this live development against one of the containers, um, and then uh, do a, a functional test or integration test and get feedback from that testing before I make my commits on this container. Um, so to, to have that type of integration feedback uh, or, or functional feedback as part of my local development loop, I think is really powerful if you're doing um, a lot of microservice development, especially when you start adding in things like caching layers between, uh, data, uh, between data tiers. Um, you can replicate all of that very easily with OpenShift. And even in cases where you cannot replicate 100% of the production workloads, you can use the uh, service to point to something outside the cluster and kind of fake it out for the, for the development staff. So um, hopefully this is a, a big takeaway and a way to show you how to uh, enable your junior develop developers with... Uh, a containerized workflow and and more visibility than they've had in the past um, for these more complicated problems uh, without putting uh, barriers in their workflow where they have to run a build as a prerequisite in order to get some feedback, right? We want to give you feedback during your real-time dev loop, and that's what this is all about. Yeah. So I just, I feel like I have to say this. So don't use OCR sync in production. <laughs> um, it's pushing like a file into your running container. So this would be definitely for doing your local development, that inner loop stuff. Um, it's also only pushing it to one pod. So like if you've got, you know, five pods, like just only use this for, for local development. Yes. You, you can use Jenkins with, with OpenShift for sure, yeah. We do have Jenkins in the uh, service catalog. Um, so if you want to look at the, uh, if you look in the service catalog, there will be, and I can point you to the Jenkins deployment, but there will be a, a collection of JSON or YAML files that are deployments and services and other low level things that um, all together give you a Jenkins environment. Yeah. And so you can package up that full Jenkins pipeline as part of your dev stage. And so when junior developers check out a development stage, they have their own Jenkins and their own CI tests as, as part of their own kind of decentralized uh, dev stage uh, that they can run independently, perhaps, right? And then you can have another Jenkins in, in the staging area that does a second round of checks, but they could hopefully run, get as much feedback as they need 
uh, as part of their local dev loop. Um, if that's what you, if that's the way you're doing CI, then then uh, yeah. But you can also have a lot of other testing and feedback from uh, you know uh, other Node.js based uh, build processes as well. All right, so I am going to go ahead and edit this index.html file from our repo. I'm just going to change like the h1 tag. Say, hello, OpenShift. All right, so I've changed that file. And then we are going to run this export here. What this is going to do is get us um, the name of our, our pod, basically, that has the label app equals HTTP base. And it's going to run that OCR sync. We get an error here because we're trying to upload, I think, too many things. There's some permission thing. However, it did actually do it. So if we go back to wherever it's running here um, and refresh, it says, hello, OpenShift. So it did send that file up there. Ryan, this is what I was telling you about. We get this uh, failed to set permissions thing. So it kills the watch. That's a bug. We'll figure that out. Um, <clears throat> uh, think of this as cuddle get we're running instead of it get pod w watch and offer Mm -hmm. Rather, but uh, <coughs> excuse me. That ought to be. I watched. So that's what you should be having here, except that we have this error that's killing the watch. So. So there is, we don't have time to get into this in this particular workshop, but I want to at least introduce you to another um, tool. It's, a, it's another command line tool that you can use with OpenShift called ODO, or OpenShift do, but I call it ODO. Um, and what that is also intended for is to help with this inner loop, this iterative development. Um, it's not just for Node, it's, it supports you know Java, PHP, Python, whatever, whatever you're using. Um, and it's meant to help kind of, first of all, abstract away some of the Kubernetes terminology. So you're using more kind of like Git style um, command syntax. Um, so if that's something that's interesting to you, um, you can check that out here. Um, but it, you know, to create something um, in your development loop with ODO, you would do like ODO create uh, Node.js, and you'd be deploying it from your local directory. So here you saw we, we were, it's actually there's a public git remote URL that we're deploying from. Um, ODO lets you do that local development from your actual um, laptop. So that's kind of a, a, a difference there that can be really uh, convenient. It also can do this kind of watching loop. So as you make changes, it will um, sync those up for you. Um, it's not as instantaneous as OCR sync, um, but it's a little more, what's the right word, robust, 
slightly I, more sophisticated. What I know. like about ODO is it gives me a way to, it, instead of relying on that webhook workflow to somehow call back into my local system, um, and also coupling all the builds to a commit, um, I can decouple those mm-hmm. two and use ODO and use and do a ODO push. And what that'll do is push whatever the con- whatever the current contents of my r- repo is, um, whether it's been committed or not. Mm-hmm. Push whatever's in my repo into a build pipeline, run a build, and stream the build results back into my console while it's building. Um, so it gives me a quick kind of evaluation of whether it will pass a build or not. And it actually triggers a build in my local cluster or whatever cluster I'm pointed at. And, and while decoupling the process so I could kind of test the code before I make my commit. Yeah. And then if, if it looks good, great. Then I make my commit and my git push. And maybe that'll trigger a build in some other pipeline for, for my CI team, you know. Yeah. Um, but I can do just auto push while I'm iterating. Um, or Odo R sync if I'm doing real time development. Odo watch, yeah. Or yeah, yeah Odo watch. watch, yeah, that's right. Odo there. watch for real time development. Um, and then after I'm happy that everything is working and I'm confident that the integration tests pass, then I make my commits with confidence, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and without being worried, I'm going to muck up the pipeline further downstream for for folks. So there's also something called node shift, which if you went to Luke Holmquist's um, lab yesterday, I think he may have, have talked about it there. Um, that is something it's you can like it's you can run it with like npx node shift blah blah blah. It's just another way of helping you deploy um, Node.js applications on OpenShift easily. Um, we're not again having time to get into it there. Um, Code ready containers. It sounds like at least one of you is using that already. If you want to run an OpenShift a very minimal OpenShift cluster locally on your laptop to do local development. Um, that's what Code Ready Containers can do for you. It takes a bit of memory, so you need to have a fair amount of memory available on your laptop to run it. But um, it's pretty easy to get set up um, and is nice for doing uh, local local work with OpenShift. As long as you don't try to run Java, <laughs> stick with JavaScript, and and hopefully. You'll- you can do some. You can do a fair amount of stuff, but uh, it, it requires a bit yeah, of bit of memory. Um, so that's Code Ready Containers. If you want to check that out, if you haven't seen learn.openshift.com, I'm going to open this up really quickly here just to give you a quick view. There's a bunch of tutorials here, but there's also if you just want to kick the tires or have access to a cluster for a little while to try something out, these OpenShift playgrounds. There's one for OpenShift 4.2, which is the version we were just using. If you go in here, there's no login or anything. You're going to get a 4.2 cluster for 60 minutes, do whatever, and then it goes away. So if you just need to try something out and you don't want to install Code Ready Containers, you don't need to, um, you're not ready to actually like do more than just try something out, here you go. It's similar environment to what we were using in the workshop. Um, but you can log in as admin and have full admin access here to this you know, time-limited uh, cluster. So. That's another another option if you want to try things out on your own. Um, but yeah, so we do have some time for questions. And I also just want to mention, as Ryan said, we'll be at the booth the rest of the day, um, the, the OpenShift booth out there in the um, sponsor showcase area. So we'd be happy to talk to you if you have any questions that we can't answer right now. Last. We're ready to wrap it up. I'm ready. <clears throat> Okay, I got two two last things to shout out for you. So Jan just mentioned this learn.openshift.com. I have some of these cards if anyone wants a, a reminder about learn.openshift uh, for like one hour uh, sessions uh, without any sign up or other expectations. Um, the other thing that I wanted to point out, we have a link in the slides to this O'Reilly book. If you're interested in a a free O'Reilly book on OpenShift, uh, click on that link and you'll get a PDF download. I will say it's uh, the content in that book is on OpenShift 3. So Mm -hmm. the web interface will be different than what you have, but most of the command line stuff is all the same. 
It's both, uh, you know, still Kubernetes under the hood mm-hmm. and trying to achieve a, a, a PaaS style solution on top. Um, so we covered uh, some of this Kubernetes terminology. Um, we didn't really dig too deeply into all of these, but we learned about routes um, and uh, ask me about it, other details if you like. Uh, last thing I wanted to give you a link to was try.openshift.com. This is a good way to get started with uh, new clusters if you are interested in trying OpenShift on any cloud you like, you can deploy, you need a, a developer account, Red Hat developer account, but you can de- set it up on your laptop, set it up on Amazon, set it up on Google, set it up on uh, any cloud you like, um, and uh, be able to, even on bare metal, uh, and once you have it up and running, uh, we try to bring in uh, not just the support and expertise from the folks at Red Hat, but um, help from kind of the whole rest of the industry as well. So even if you're running on bare metal, we want you to have uh, really solid access to uh, products like uh, Redis uh, backed by you know the actual maintainers at Redis Labs. And if you're using uh, MongoDB, we've got um, actual Mongo provided by MongoDB Incorporated. Um, so we try to work with uh, all the maintainers in the industry. We have a, a shared support model with all these folks. So if you're an uh, enterprise uh, company who's uh, interested in picking up support and making sure that the support dollars are directed towards uh, qualified folks who are uh, involved in main- maintaining the code upstream, this is a great way to ensure that you're able to reproduce uh, any of these data stores um, on any cloud, even bare metal, um, and uh, support the right experts in the in the community, right? Uh, so each of these, uh, if you wanna give this operator hub a try, we have this operator hub embedded in the, uh, in the dashboard. We're logged in. Logged in as a standard user, so you don't have access. Uh, That's an admin-only feature, but you can try it out on your own with OpenShift 4. And so uh, administrators can go in, let's say uh, CouchDB, if they wanted to install this, you can run this kubectuddle create on any cluster, even a GKE cluster or an Amazon Kubernetes. Anybody's Kubernetes, you ought to be able to use kubectuddle and standard tools um, when you run this command, it will install a new custom resource on the API, and then you'll be able to kubectuddle get couch bases or you know fetch some new resource type that Kubernetes doesn't know about. And um, so all of these operators uh, provide ways of extending the Kubernetes API to add new resource types um, while still maintaining the same kind of pattern that we've all learned hopefully through this workshop. The API is going to be asynchronous and it's going to have a spec and a status, right? If you don't remember anything else, it's asynchronous, it's JSON, you could do YAML too, but spec and status. And you set the spec and you read from the status. And that's how all of these data stores work on Kubernetes. They create a a new resource type, you set the spec, you say what I need, and Kubernetes goes to work fulfilling your dependencies. And so uh, we're encouraging all the major uh, data service and kind of soft infrastructure providers to jump in and develop their own um, extensions for Kubernetes. Uh, So hopefully uh, you folks find a lot of success with the information we've put out here. Uh, definitely uh, give us feedback if you have any thoughts on any of this. Um, and find us in the booth. Oh, these are my old slides. I tried to add <laughs> I tried to add Jan. There should be a picture okay. of Jan on there as well. Um, but yeah, thank you very much. I'm Ryan J. We've got Jan Kleinert. Uh, thanks again. We'll be in the booth.